Well, hi there. I'm so happy that you're joining us online. We're always happy to have our EFAM or our online congregation with us. And you might be thinking, this looks a little bit different. This looks a little bit uh, strange. It's not what I'm used to. Well, we had some technical difficulties. So today it's just you and me in an empty room, but, but you're worth it. So I decided now I'm still going to record a message just for you. So um, I, I want you to know that you are valuable to us. And I want to give a shout out to everyone that joins week after week. And, and you're really a part of this uh, this church even though you're far i also want to thank all those who are who are diligent in joining but also those who are giving online and we appreciate you guys and um, thank you for for uh supporting us in furthering the kingdom of God here through this little local body so i hope that you enjoy this message we're going to be turning to the book of nehemiah today and I'm going to give you just a moment, even though it's going to be on the screen, but if you have your Bible with you and you want to join in on your Bible, you're welcome to do so. We're in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 2 to 7. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 2 to 7. And it reads, Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some of the other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted and prayed to the God of heaven and said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Skipping over to chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Early the following spring, in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, If it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king with the queen sitting beside him asked, How long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I'll be gone, the king agreed to my request. Let's just pray. Thank you, Lord, that, that we have this amazing privilege of getting together online today. And I pray that we'll be encouraged from your word. And I pray that we'll, we'll learn from it and, and that we'll start putting these practices in place in our lives as well. Lord, as we start rebuilding today, I pray that every brick we put in place would be able to stand the test of time. Amen. So one of our favorite things to do as a family is to build Lego. So, so we go upstairs and, and we go to the lounge and, and we sit and we start building Legos. And it really is amazing. And just the other day, we, we, well, I went upstairs first. I told the kids, come, let's go. Let's go play some Legos. And I went upstairs and I started building. And, and you should have seen it. It was just absolutely phenomenal. My skills are, are insane. I never knew this. But, but as I was building, I, I built this, this elephant um, and it was majestic. It was really, I mean, next to God's design of an elephant, it's the most beautiful thing you'll, you'll ever see. And it was just beautiful elephant. And, and I bought an ostrich, I think, or so, a flamingo or something like that on the other side. And it was just stunning. It was, it was absolutely beautiful. And, and the whole time while I'm building, I'm thinking, oh man, my kids are going to love this. And I'm pouring my heart into it. And I'm just thinking, man, Abby's going to come up here. Will's going to come up here. And they're going to say, this is it, dad. You crush this. This is amazing. So a couple of minutes later, they, they walked into the the room they're coming to join us now to play lego on the floor and as they come they abby takes my my elephant and and she she gives it this glance and she starts ripping it into pieces i mean as those bricks fall to the floor my heart falls to the floor with it i worked hard on that i mean i poured my life into that but anyway and uh, we use it as a bit of a teachable moment but but sitting there and and looking at these bricks laying on the floor i, I realized that, that i have one of two choices 
Uh, in that moment, I had one of two choices of what I could do about the predicament of my design, of my creation. I, I could look at it and I could mourn the loss of the most phenomenal thing the world has probably ever seen, or I can start rebuilding. Or I could start rebuilding. And that's, that's the question I want to ask you today. That's the simple question I want to ask. Is will you rebuild? Will you rebuild? Because I learned a valuable lesson sitting on that floor that evening. I, I looked at the bricks. And it doesn't matter what I did. The bricks were not going to rebuild itself. It wasn't. It wasn't automatically going to jump back into this incredible design of an elephant or, or whatever it was. It wasn't going to jump back into to what your marriage was years ago. The relationships weren't going to restore themselves. It, it, it was broken. It wasn't going to rebuild itself. And I had to choose, will I rebuild? Because here's the thing. It, it doesn't matter how it got broken. And this is important. I mean, Israel didn't go out and break Jerusalem's walls themselves. Not a chance. That's not how it happened. Because it's kind of irrelevant how it happened, how it broke. The choice we have is not will we break it down. The choice we have, the thing we have to commit to is will we actually rebuild it? That, that, that's the choice you have. Because no, it's not your fault that some of these things happen. It's, it's not always our fault that some of these, it's not no one's fault that COVID came and that, that it negatively affected our lives and that it negatively affected our churches and that it negatively affected our, our communities, our finances, our businesses. But the question is not, oh man, I wish we could go back to pre-COVID. No, the question is, will you rebuild post-COVID? Because that is up to you. That is up to you. And I want to give us some key things about, about what it will take because at the end of the day, listen, I'm seeing a lot of brokenness. A lot of brokenness. I'm seeing a lot of suffering. I'm seeing a lot of relationships that, that's laying in tatters. I'm seeing a lot of marriages that need a lot of work. I'm, I'm seeing businesses and towns that need rebuilding. And, and here, the first key we get from Nehemiah in reading this book is it shouldn't be shattered. It shouldn't be shattered. Because Nehemiah, the first thing he did was realize it shouldn't be as it was. Some people say, no, the first thing he did was mourn. No, 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 the morning came second. The first thing was realizing, wait a second, the walls weren't designed to lay on the floor. I mean, you, we see that because he didn't respond to his, his brother Hinani. He didn't say, no, listen, man, don't worry about it. That's how it's supposed to be. Walls are supposed to lay on the floor. Oh, that's fine. Leave it. No, not a chance. That's not his response. I didn't look at Abby and say, hey, you know, yeah, that's, that, was, uh, that was the plan for the elephant, you know, to be in a hundred pieces. And, and let me tell you something. I'm 100% sure God has never turned to Jesus in heaven looking down and said, well, you know, this, this hatred, this, this anger, this brokenness, this resentment, this, this uh, I don't know, you call it. I mean, this is really an improvement on our design. No, he's never said that. This divorce, this fatherless generation, this is not how it should be. It's not. Because it shouldn't be shattered. We have to realize things are broken, but they shouldn't be. Things are out of place, but it shouldn't be. Relationships are hurting, but it shouldn't be. Because when we realize it shouldn't be, then we can actually start doing something. Because you will never be able to build and rebuild something if you do not recognize that it's actually broken. But what we do is, is we make peace with our brokenness because it's easier than to rebuild it. It's easier to wipe things under the mat. It's easier not to engage with that conflict because sometimes conflict will come, but it's easier. So we make peace with our brokenness and we pretend that we're okay. We pretend that things are okay, but we have to deal with the pain. We have to deal with the situation. We have to deal with the brokenness. We have to confront the fear. See, we can go along and driving our cars for as long as we want to, pretending like, like the uh, engine warning light isn't on. 
And we can even paste something over it and say, well, now I don't see it. Now I don't see the brokenness. But at some point, something will go horribly wrong. Because let me tell you, things go horribly wrong. And when that happens, it will reveal everything that was underlying. It will reveal it. See, at the first sign of brokenness, we should respond. At the first sign, the first red light of check engine, the first time that, that there's a tiff or there's an argument, we should have that check engine sign looking at us and thinking, man, we need to do something about this here and now because leaving it will be detrimental. We should never look at ruins, look at broken down walls and pretend it's okay because God cannot help us restore something that we pretend isn't broken. First step, first step is we have to recognize things are broken, but realize it shouldn't be. And then we see this amazing response that Nehemiah had. I mean, he noticed that, that obviously this shouldn't be the state of Jerusalem. He's recognizing this shouldn't be as, as it is. And then we need to note his response. And his response was he broke down. He wept and he mourned for days. And the reason is very simple. It's because he cared deeply. And this is vitally, vitally important, is we need to care enough to do something. We need to care enough to change something. We need to care enough to start something. We need to care enough to give something. And we need to care enough to build something. We need to care. It's not enough to recognize something is broken. It is important that we want to see it fixed. It's not enough to recognize that it's not as it should be. We need to care enough to do something about it. To do something about it. And sometimes we think, no, hon, it's too late. It's too late. No, it's not. It's too late for my relationships. No, it's not. It's too late for my marriage. No. No, it's not. The question is, will you rebuild it? That is the main question. And, and this is important point, caring enough. And I want to tell you a funny story. And listen, the story is not aimed at anyone. Even though some people might feel like I'm, I'm talking to them, the story is not aimed at anyone. It's just illustrating this point amazingly. Um, but if you want to take it, take it, you know, whatever. But uh, it's a story of a lady. I don't know if it's true or not. It's definitely, it didn't happen in this church. And it's probably a story you've heard preachers tell before. But anyway, so this lady was in the church. And um, after church, they would have prayer times where you can come forward and you can ask for prayer with the elders or with the pastor or whatever. Uh, and this lady comes forward and she tells the elders that she's praying with, you know, and she says, man, I want to quit smoking because she was a great lady and everyone loved her and she worked hard and she invested into the church, her time, her money, her efforts. And, um, but, but she had this issue of smoking and they would pray with her and, and the results varied. You know, sometimes she would go a week without smoking. Otherwise she'd go other times she would go about an hour. And, um, as the results varied, she came week after week after week and she asked for prayer and they would pray for her, lay on hands, you know, the drill. And, um, one day she comes up after the service and the pastor sees her coming. And he thinks, okay, now he'll pray for her this, this time. And as she comes to him, she says, come here, I want to pray for you. And she tells him the story again of how she's struggling to break through this thing and that this is a real issue in her life. And she recognizes that this is not as it should be, etc., etc. And the pastor looks at her and he says, okay, let's pray. And he starts and he says, Lord, if she ever so much as looks at a cigarette again, will you smite her down, kill her, murder her, and make her lay dead on the floor there where she stands? And as he's praying, she's she just starts screaming, no, 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 no. And <laughs> because she recognized something was out of place. She recognized something wasn't as it should be. She recognized the brokenness. She just didn't care enough to do something about it. She just, she, yeah. she recognized that this is an issue in her life. But she lacked the care. She lacked the care to do something about it. See, if there isn't a burning desire in our lives to see a different outcome for, to know a different outcome, you will never find the strength to do anything about it. No, you'll only find strength to make excuses not to do anything about it. Not to do anything about it. 
See, we've got this amazing privilege that we have the Holy Spirit that is empowering us from the inside, helping us and guiding us and strengthening us to live this Christian life, to walk this Christian walk. But we're still going to have to walk. We're still going to have to care. We're still going to have to do something. And here I want to warn you about something that, that is relevant to our time, and that is apathy. Apathy creeps into our lives, and it's that feeling of, of indifference or, or a lack of interest or emotion. And, and the problem is we become apathetic towards things that matter. See, if apathy is this idea of I just don't care enough, to do something about it. It's just, I'm indifferent about it. You know, it's like, I'm going to have a hot dog, but tomato sauce, mustard, ah, it doesn't really matter. I'll have whatever you have kind of a thing. Now, now listen, I, I'm okay with you being apathetic or indifferent about what kind of hot dogs you eat or don't eat. I, I'm down with that, whatever. I'm apathetic about it as well. I don't care. I'm completely indifferent whether it's tomato sauce or mustard. But I'm not okay if we're being apathetic or indifferent about things that are serious in our lives. We can't be apathetic towards the enemy ruining our, li ruining our lives w through anger and negativity. We, we can't be apathetic about marriages that's falling apart or relationships that's being torn apart. We can't be apathetic about people falling away from the faith or people don't even knowing Jesus. These are not things we can be apathetic about. We could never and should never be apathetic about churches emptying out. See, this apathy thing, it, it comes and it makes us numb towards the things that matter. But we need the fire of God in us again to say, no, I care. I care. I care about my marriage. I care about my business. I care about my church. And I'm not going to see it go down. I'm not going to watch the, the walls lay on the floor. I'm not going to watch those bricks laying in the sun. I'm going to rebuild I'm going to rebuild because I will no longer let the enemy wreak havoc because I care enough to do something about it, to build something, to change something, to start something. I care enough. And what an interesting point for me about, about Nehemiah is that, man, he wasn't even doing it for himself. He was not even going to enjoy the fruits of his labor. If you look at chapter 2, verse 6, it says, The king with the queen sitting beside him, asked, How long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. So before he even goes, he asked the king, Hey, I want to go. The king says, All right, so how long are you going to be gone? And then he almost, like, he leaves it a secret. He doesn't tell us how long because, I don't know, maybe he was afraid someone was listening or was reading, but he knew that it was just going to be a short time. And, and he told him, and it says, after I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. After he knew the time span, the king said, okay, great, you can go for it. And this is important because we don't always realize that there are other people going to be benefiting from our work. Because we're not just doing this for ourselves. We're not just living righteous lives for me. I'm living righteously so that my children can inherit the blessings of my life. So that they can walk in the freedom of my decisions. I want to set them up for success because that is what we're doing. We are setting them up for the best successful life possible. See, if I didn't choose to re-record just for you guys today, you would be suffering. Or you would be, let's rather say, missing out. And we don't always realize how much of an effect our lives and those things we do and don't do actually have. But what we want to do through, re, through rebuilding, we want others to be blessed as well. Because that was Nehemiah's focus. He said, man, I might not be the one who's going to benefit from it, but I care enough about it so that other people might reap the rewards, the fruits of my labor. I want to finish up by, by just quickly saying that we mustn't be surprised here when, when we meet resistance. We didn't have time to read the whole book. That would take a while. 
But if we read it, we see that the enemies of Jerusalem started routing up. And as they were building, they came against them. And they started mocking them and making jokes and saying, and, and, and listen, this is very appropriate because we see that in our lives as well. You know, when, when we start rebuilding, when, when we look at things, then we hear people saying, you know, whatever, man, this thing is beyond fixing. You know, your, your marriage, nah, it's over. There's nothing you can do about it. You know, those, oh, those children of yours, oh, man, there's nothing. And, and, and these things are, are so often spoken, so often mockingly spoken that we start believing them but but these attacks come but it didn't deter them from doing what needed to be done and we look and they continued building and I love Nehemiah says they built with all their heart so it was going up quickly and as the walls were going up quickly their enemies around them started thinking oh man this is actually a problem this is actually a threat this is actually something we need to do something about and and they wanted to start attacking them and then it's so incredible because as their enemies started getting serious they responded by getting ready for their resistance getting ready for their resistance. So they started working harder. They started stationing the troops. And then my absolute favorite, what they did, and we find that Nehemiah 4.17, the laborers who carried the loads worked with one hand and held a hip or weapon with the other. How incredible is that? So they were rebuilding with one hand and in the other hand, they were ready for the resistance. They were ready for the resistance. Are you ready for resistance? Because listen, you've got one of two choices. Listening to this message today, you've got one of two choices. You're going to decide, I'm going to rebuild or I just don't care enough to do something. I'm going to rebuild my relationships, my business, my marriage, or I don't care enough to do something. But if you choose to start rebuilding, the enemy's not going to be happy with a church that is rising up to fulfill the call that we have been created for, to be the light and the salt of the earth, to make a difference. But what we do is we start getting ready for the resistance by arming ourselves. And what we're doing is we're reading God's word and we're spending time in prayer and we go to church and we worship and we commit to this discipleship journey because this is our weapon. We're readying for resistance. We're readying for resistance. And when the resistance comes, we'll remind ourselves and our enemy that the walls were built. The walls stood again. The gates were in place. Remind the enemy of the promise of Jesus Christ that, that man, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. It will be built. Remind ourselves of the promise that Jesus died for us for our salvation so that we might have life and have it in abundance. He died for us so that our load doesn't have to be heavy, but rather our burden can be light. This is the promise. We need to get ready for resistance. Because at the end of the day, there are broken walls. There are broken things. There are broken marriages. There are broken relationships. There are broken people. There are broken businesses. There are broken churches. But we shouldn't be broken. It shouldn't be. It should be rebuilt. And we care enough not to see those bricks lay on the floor another day. But rather, we're being motivated by the Spirit of God to do something, to build something. Let me pray with you. Thank you, Lord, that, that we have this incredible message from, from Nehemiah that we should rebuild, that things are shattered, but they shouldn't be. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help each and every one of us, that you would strengthen us, that you would give us the wisdom and the strategy to rebuild like wise builders. Thank you, Lord, for this message. And I pray for every person that's listening right now, for every person that, that listened to this message. I pray that you will show them which walls needs rebuilding, that you would guide them in the rebuilding process, and that you would ready us for resistance by filling us with your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to share your word. And I just want to pray a blessing upon each person who listened. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.